So, dear colleagues, we are very glad to continue the EU study base project, the project which is launched by the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. And we are very glad to, uh, to invite here Mr. Martin Day, who is Deputy Head of the of British Embassy to Ukraine, Deputy Head of Mission. Uh, Mr. Day will, will speak about the association agreement and all the political things which are going on now in the EU Ukraine relations. Martin. Thank you. Can I come and stand here? Szanowni Pani Tapanowe, dobry den. I dziękuję za możliwość spotkania się dzisiaj. Jak wy wzie patrzyli, ja nie rozmawiają ukraińską mowę dobrze. So with apologies, I am going to speak English. Um, if I speak too fast, if I say anything that you don't understand, if I use too many acronyms, letters that don't make sense, stop me. Uh, and as Victoria said, ask questions. If I'm speaking rubbish, tell me I'm speaking rubbish. <laughs> Uh, if you agree with me, tell me you agree with me. But please, let's have a discussion, um, because uh, you've been sitting in this room for a long time. Um, it's almost the end of the day, so, so let's have some fun. Let's talk about some, some serious issues, but let's do it in, in a fun way. Um, I think I'm right in remembering that it was the great playwright Anton Chekhov who said that, Karatkas sistra talanta. So I'm not going to speak for very long. Um, for two reasons. One, so that when I finish, you're going to say, I'm a very talented man because I didn't speak for long. But more importantly, as I say, to give time for questions because I think that's where the most advantage is for you, but very much for me as well, because I want to hear what you think uh, and I want to hear what you think about, about the European Union. Um, I've been asked to speak about the association agreement and the deep and comprehensive free trade area um, and in particular what I would like to focus on is the benefits that will come from that because I think that the media in this country and people like me spend too much time talking about the problems. I'm happy to talk about the problems later if you want to ask me about uh, issues to do with Yulia Tymoshenko, with reform of the judiciary, whatever, please ask those questions. But let's talk about the positive aspects of the association agreement and DCFDA. Um, and if it seems a bit odd to you that you have a British diplomat standing up talking positively about the European Union, let me just sort of start with that. Um, you may well know that my government has said, well, or the Conservative Party has said, that if they win the next election in the UK, they will hold a referendum on whether Britain should stay or leave the European Union. But David Cameron, the Prime Minister, has said very clearly he hopes Britain will stay in the European Union, but in a reformed European Union. So there are reforms that the British government would like to see introduced, which would make, we believe, Europe better for all the member states, uh, including, the Europe, uh, including the UK. And why David Cameron wants to stay uh, in the European Union is, I think, for two main reasons. One is the single market. Uh, Britain has always been a trading nation and has derived enormous benefit from being part of the world's largest single market, 500 million consumers, a combined economy uh, equivalent to $17 trillion. It's massive. And whatever you might hear or read that Europe has collapsed, that everyone is on the street begging for money, it isn't true. Of course, there are some difficulties. Of course, we've had a financial crisis. But standards of living in the UK, standards of living in Europe are high. Uh, the British economy is growing. So the first benefit that David Cameron would point to is the single market. The second he would point to is the benefits that have come from enlargement, from making the European Union bigger, adding new members. And you'll all know that Croatia became the 28th member state earlier this year. And successive British governments have looked at enlargement and said, 
that that enlargement spreading prosperity, spreading security across uh, the whole of the European continent is one of the, the main benefits of the European Union. Today, the possibility of war between any of the member states is, is literally impossible. Uh, and we think that further enlarging uh, the European Union is good for Europe and good for those new member states. Which brings me to Ukraine and brings us to the uh, Association Agreement and, and DCFTA. Uh, at the moment, there is no consensus, no agreement that Ukraine should become a member state. That currently does not exist, and it is quite a, a controversial issue for, for some member states. But I am very happy and very proud to stand here today and say that my government believes that when the time is right, when Ukraine has moved further forward in terms of uh, you, the way your country functions, and if, and this is very important, if you Ukrainians want to be part of the European Union, we think you should be a member state. So for us, the association agreement and the DCFTA, which uh, we hope will be signed in November, I'll come back to the uh, the we hope bit, um, but I know you heard a little bit this morning about, about the conditions that were set out in December 2012. But we hope that uh, if the association agreement is signed in Vilnius, that is the first step along the road of European integration that could lead to eventual membership. So it's the first and not the last step. Now, why does that you know, matter? Why should you, why should your friends, why should your families actually think that is a good thing? And if you look at the opinion polls, you know, there, is a, there are more people who seem to think that Europe would be a good thing for Ukraine than think the customs union would be a good thing for Ukraine. But it's not as clear a difference as I personally believe uh, it should be. Um, and so therefore what I'd like to do is, is run through why I think, uh, what I think some of the reasons why Ukraine's closer integration with Europe will be a good thing. And in doing that, I don't want to suggest in any way that everything in Europe is perfect, that uh, there are no problems in Europe. Of course there are, but actually we're a pretty good club to belong to, um, and uh, that's why we think enlarging that club is a good thing when new members are, are ready. But in pointing out some of the benefits, I don't want, to think, I don't want you to think I'm saying Europe good, Ukraine not so good. But let's talk about those, let's talk about the benefits. I think above all else, I want to start with the economy and with economic benefits because in every country that I've lived in, and I've spent most of my career working in the Middle East and, and North Africa, and it's as true there as it is in the Czech Republic where I've also worked, but also in, in the United Kingdom, that what actually most people care about uh, in their day-to-day -day lives and what they care about when they go to vote is how much money they have in their pocket. And what that means in practical terms. If they have children, can they educate their children well? Can they buy them clothes? Can they buy enough food to, to feed them? And then hopefully also, can they go on a nice holiday? And if someone falls sick, you know, if you have to pay for your health care, can you afford to, to pay for that health care? But at the end of the day, if you're earning a decent wage and there are jobs available, then for most people, I would suggest that is the most important thing uh, in their lives and what motivates them when they vote. And I think that the association agreement and the DCFTA are in that context, good for Ukraine. Now, I'm going to give you some figures, and I'm not an economist, so don't ask me too much about those figures. But uh, figures are important, but one important health check. I don't know the future. 
If I knew the future, I would not be standing here. I would be earning a lot of money doing other things. I cannot tell you what's going to happen in the future. But the figures I'm going to quote are figures that have been drawn up by serious experts looking at uh, the possible impact of these agreements on Ukraine and your economy. And the headline figure, based on a study done by some German experts working with Ukrainian experts, and the German experts have been in this country more or less since independence, so they know your country well, but working with the Institute of Economic Relations in, in Kiev, they have forecast that for the Ukrainian economy in the long term, the DCFTA will lead to increased living standards of about 11.8%. Now, again, the health warning, it, we're talking about the future. So, but it's a big figure, is my point. They say that Ukrainian exports will grow by about 6%, and that European imports into Ukraine will go by 5%. So more growth for Ukrainian exports than for imports. Now, why is that? There are a variety of reasons, but one of the significant reasons is that the barriers to trade that currently exist, and they are many, there are things like you know, the tariffs, the percentages that are added to imports or exports, will largely be removed. Some 95% of tariffs will be removed. Now, some of the figures I'm quoting, I get from this publication. Uh, and they have started publishing on a weekly basis these sort of infographics. And for those of you who prefer to read, read these things in Ukrainian, go to Ukrainska Pravda, and they have it as well. But they're really, really good summaries of, of what these changes can mean. And, and this week, uh, this is all about agricultural products. And for those of you with better eyesight than I've got, they are saying that the reduction in uh, tariffs for agricultural goods going to Europe will save Ukrainian companies 383 million euros a year. That's quite a big number. There are caveats. I don't want to stand here and talk propaganda to you. That's, that's not going to help you. It's not going to help me. One important caveat is we have in Europe some very high hygiene, phytosanitary standards that say we don't want any country to sell us food or drink if it doesn't meet our high health standards. So Ukrainian exporters in the agricultural sector are going to be able to export to the EU when they meet those standards. A lot of your chicken producers do that now. You may have seen earlier this year that chicken exports from Ukraine started to the EU. But also I've read recently that two thirds of your milk produced in Ukraine does not meet EU standards. It contains too many chemicals, antibiotics, that sort of thing. So it could not, until that changes, be exported to the UK. But that is where I think some of the other benefits from these agreements come, because it's not just about the economic opportunity for your companies, but it's also for you, for your families, for your children, if you have them or if you will have them, is to be eating and drinking safer food. So there are lots of what I call virtuous circles that come from these rules and regulations that are part of these agreements. But let me just remind you of that figure I mentioned earlier, that the single market is a market of 500 million consumers. It's the world's largest single market, and that is the opportunity for Ukrainian companies, is to do business there and to compete. Now, if you look at the experience of companies, uh, sorry, of countries like Poland, uh, Slovakia, the countries that joined in 2004, joined the EU in 2004, or Bulgaria and Romania who joined more recently and Croatia more recently still, they have gone through the same sort of association process. It might have had a different name in those days, but they had to change their legislation to make the standards the same so that their companies could compete. And I want to be honest, that is not an easy process. Some companies, some Ukrainian companies, will not succeed. 
So some companies will go bust, will go bankrupt. But again, I think that sounds tough, but that's an everyday part of economic life. In my own country, each year, thousands and thousands of British companies go bust, stop trading. But the good thing is that thousands and thousands and thousands of companies start trading. And what you're doing is looking for that opportunity, looking for companies that have something special, a special product, they can do something a bit cheaper, they've got good marketing, whatever it is that allows them to make a profit, to pay people, so that we all go home with money in our pockets. And it is that opportunity that is being offered uh, to Ukraine through this uh, DCFTA. And by setting standards, and there will be British companies and indeed British political parties who will complain sometimes about that, those standards and say that Brussels is imposing unnecessary rules and regulations on us. That's, a, that's perhaps another debate. But what it does allow you to do and will allow Ukrainian companies to do is once they have uh, met those standards, they will be able to sell not only their products or services into Europe, 500 million consumers again, a quarter of the world economy, but also because they met those standards, they can sell those products to other markets in the world as well, because those EU standards are accepted. That, to me, is an enormous opportunity for your companies to compete uh, in the premier division rather than the second division and, and create wealth. But once again, I don't want to be sound naive and say that uh, the day these agreements are signed, uh, if and when they are signed, you know, everything is rosy and everything is easy. No, it's serious, hard work. And I was talking the other night to, my, uh, to one of uh, Victoria's colleagues who is, is Slovakian, a Slovakian diplomat. And she was telling me how difficult that process was for Slovak companies. But she was absolutely clear that today that whole process has been very positive for Slovakia and that Slovakia is a better place for that process. I think another thing that... Um, Ukraine adapting standards, legislation to these famous European standards that we talk about, another very real benefit and opportunity that process creates is the likelihood that much more foreign direct investment will come to Ukraine. I say that as a, as a British citizen, as a British diplomat, and in recent years the British economy has attracted 20% of all foreign direct investment into Europe. So one out of every five foreign investments into Europe has gone to one country. That has been enormously positive for the British economy. And just to give you one small example, uh, do any of you like the, the Mini, the car, the Mini? Yes. Yeah? It's pretty expensive, but it's a nice car, yeah? Now, minis have been produced for many, many years. And they used to be produced by a state-owned company, a nationalized British company, that was not the most successful company. Productivity was not great. Strikes. The product was not very good. Minis didn't have a particularly good reputation. There were various changes which led ultimately to uh, BMW, a German company investing into MINI. And that combination of some German expertise, British workers, and, and all of the, the sort of work together that was done has now created a very, very successful British-made car. And today, there is not one British car company owned by British companies. But, just to give you the brands, Mini, Range Rover, Aston Martin, Bentley, Rolls-Royce. I'd like one of them. I don't, I, I don't own any of them. I'd love to have one of them. They're good cars. But 
It's foreign direct investment that has come in, working with British brands, British expertise. And we live today in a globalized economy, a small world village where investors can choose where they're going to invest their money. Now, Ukraine has many, many advantages. Near the top of the list is people like you, young, well-educated, a young, well-educated workforce. That's what investors want. They also want location. You, are, you have a very good location. You know, you're, you're on the edge of the EU as it is today. You have a big neighbor to the north. We might talk about that a little bit later. You have a lot of natural resources that are very exciting for foreign companies. You have shale gas, uh, slants of your gas. Um, and Shell, Anglo-Dutch company, is, is not a million miles from here looking for that gas, which will help your energy security. Agricultural resources. But the point is that companies can choose where they wish to invest that money. And one of the challenges at the moment that Ukraine needs to overcome is that your business climate, your investment climate, is not as positive as it should be. And therefore, hopefully, through this process of uh, European integration, of changing your laws, introducing more uh, sort of competitive practice, better government procurement, uh, less corruption, all of which there are mechanisms within the, the agreements to help with, you will create a better business climate for foreign investors, but also for, for your own companies, which is just as important. So lots and lots of potential economic benefits through competition, through the chance to compete, through the chance to make money on the world stage. But it's not just about money in pockets. There are other things that, will, that should improve through the hard work of implementing the association agreement. Um, I read recently, I think the figure was that 27% 20 of Ukrainians are happy with the quality of their drinking water. Uh, I read in the same article that in Germany, where Holger is from, and in Britain, where I am from, that percentage is 97%. Now, it's all about quality of life as well. And what the EU is good at doing is setting those standards uh, that we all have to meet to help raise those standards. Now, as I say, sometimes British... Uh, Politicians and British companies will complain about those, uh, those standards. But the European Union has a very solid track record of allowing standards to rise. And if you look at companies, uh, sorry, countries like Poland that have been uh, member states since 2004, you can see the overall results of some of the, these changes in terms of uh, higher drinking water standards, higher air standards, better food standards, and so on in life expectancy. If you look at life expectancy in Poland, it's when, it, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and, and we all know that history, it was 71. It is 76 today. If you look at Ukraine, it has not matched that, that move. So the sorts of changes that can come in that area can be very positive for quality of life not just about the money that you have, but the quality of life that you have. Education. There's almost nothing more important than education. I have two children, and for me, it's right at the top of my list. Now, I think Victoria mentioned Erasmus, Tempus. Those sorts of contacts, those sorts of programs will continue. I am certain that they will develop further and they will inc encourage more and more contact between universities, schools and individual students. And just to pause very briefly for a, uh, an advert, uh, which is to say if you are potentially interested in studying in the UK and taking a master's degree, then please go and have a look at the British Embassy website, uh, UK in Ukraine. Uh, we are currently taking applications for our scholarship program, which is called the Chevening Scholarship Program. Um, so if you're interested, go and have a look uh, and you know, 
put in an application. We've, there are 300 beneficiaries over the years from Ukraine, and we're looking for the latest group to send to the UK. But as Ukraine becomes part of the single European educational space, the benefits that flow from that will be, will be very enorm enormous. And I think linked to that, there will be more and more people-to-people -people contacts. Businesses will be doing more business together, so they will be meeting each other, they'll be traveling more. As wealth increases here in Ukraine, we've talked about this German-Ukrainian study forecasting 11% 11 plus, 11 plus increase in living standards, more and more Ukrainians will be able to travel. Now, I guess um, I'm going to get questions, uh, if I don't answer them now, about visas. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions about visas as well. Um, and I know it is a difficult issue, but I want to ask you a question before I go on talking. Uh, several questions, probably. Uh, my first one is, how easy is it to get a British visa? <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, okay, right, so it's difficult. What percentage of Ukrainians last year got their visa when they applied, their British visa when they applied? What do we think? Oh, sorry, how many? Three or four percent? About 40 percent? 30 percent? 80. 80? I like you, yes. <laughs> any, any more? 80? Yeah, yeah, that's a bit difficult. 92%. 92% of Ukrainians who applied for a British visa last year got that visa. Yes, we do have demands, but what that figure tells me, and I hope tells you, is that if you give us the information we ask for, then actually you're pretty likely to get your visa. And Britain has always been a trading nation. We are very proud of our educational system. Four British universities in the top ten in the world. We are an open society. We do have a visa regime, but it is uh, possible to get a British visa, as I hope those statistics show. So if you want to visit us, please do. Then, for Schengen countries, there is you know, the uh, visa liberalization plan which holds out the prospect of, of easier travel, but asks for some things in return from your government. And progress, you know, your government and, and the EU the, on the Schengen zone side have not yet reached the end of, of stage one, but there is, again, an opportunity there. I haven't talked much, I think I mentioned the word corruption. Um, certainly my Ukrainian friends and colleagues talk a lot about corruption to me and, and the problems that it can cause in, in Ukraine. Uh, Transparency International, which is a very respected uh, international organization, ranks Ukraine 144th in the world in terms of corruption and the way it is perceived. Uh, the average for EU countries is 36. Britain, where are we? Number 17, Germany, 13. They're a bit better than us. <laughs> yeah? Just throw it in because it might come up. Customs Union countries rank 130. Russia, 133. Kazakhstan, 133. Belarus, 123. The European average is 36. And going back to businesses, they want to invest in a, in a market where they can do business in a straightforward way. They don't want any advantages. Well, they probably do want some advantages, but they expect they're not going to get them. They just want a level playing field, the same opportunities for them as for everyone else. And where there is corruption, where if you pay someone a bribe, you can get another deal, um, is a real problem, as is the rule of law. They want one law for you, me, and everyone else. And I think that's what, again, I hear from a lot of Ukrainians, that they want a judi judicial system that is open, that is transparent, 
and that yes, if you've done something wrong, there is a, there is a penalty at the end. But if you haven't, it doesn't matter who you are, you will get off. You know, the judge makes the decision on the base of, basis of the evidence. So the rule of law is very important for that. And I think through the EU, there will be new mechanisms, you know, new procedures for government procurement, new rules on competition to create that level playing field that will allow Ukrainian companies, European companies, and other foreign companies to compete on a level basis. I want to talk about your neighbor to the north, Russia, uh, and the customs union a little bit. There is nothing in any of the proposed agreements with the EU that will prevent Ukraine looking to develop its relationships with Russia with com at an economic level, a commercial level, cultural, people to people. Indeed, we look at the map and see where Ukraine is and say, of course, you will want to have strong trading and business relations and cultural relations and all of those things with Russia. Of course you do. We do as well in Britain. So does Germany. Russia is, is an important part of the international community. And of course, we would expect Ukraine to want to develop those relations. There is a choice, though. You can't be, Ukraine or any other country, can't be a member of the DCFTA, sign up to the DCFTA, and the customs union. Because the DCFTA is largely about, uh, in one area, reducing tariffs, and the customs union, Ukraine would have to increase tariffs. Now, you can't do both. You have to do one or the other. And Britain has always believed that the best way to increase wealth is to free up trade. If you have a company that is producing a product that people don't want to buy, that's not mine, is it? No. Um, if you have a company that is producing a product that people don't want to buy, by building tariff walls and putting in place protectionist measures, that doesn't mean that people will want to buy that product. You make that product better. Think back to my story about minis. What made people want to buy minis was the fact that they were suddenly really good cars. So that's why the DCFTA, one of the reasons I think it is positive is it is about reducing barriers to trade. But there is that choice. You can't be members of both clubs. But it's not what we call in English a zero-sum game. So yes, if Ukraine uh, wants to be part of the sign the association agreement and be part of the DCFTA, move forward with European integration. That doesn't have to be at the expense of relations with Russia. And indeed, we would argue that those uh, that Ukraine becoming more wealthy, raising its standards, would actually be good for Russia. So it's not about one side winning and the other side losing. But there is a fundamental choice between European Union and Customs Union. And just to leave a few facts and figures, we've already heard that the single market, the European market, is worth $17 trillion, 500 million uh, people, consumers, 25% of the world economy. The customs union, 2.1% uh, of the world, uh, sorry, $2.1 trillion as opposed to $17 trillion, 170 million consumers. GDP per capita, the size of the economy is divided by the numbers of people. On average, the EU GDP per capita, $32,900,000, according to the World Bank in 2012. Customs union average, 10900 Which club do you want to be part of? 
is my question. Um, I said I would come back to conditions a little bit, uh, the, the FAC conclusions, and I need to be brief. FAC conclusions, they really matter. Um, I had uh, my Minister for Europe, David Liddington, uh, with us in Kiev two weeks ago. And his message was very clear to your Prime Minister, to your Foreign Minister, to the Presidential Administration, and he, he said this publicly as well. And it was, we want to be able to sign the association agreement in Vilnius, but Britain has yet to make a decision about whether that is the right thing to do. Whether the Ukrainian government uh, and parliament has made enough progress against the conditions, as I'm sure you heard this morning, what the U European Union asked for in December 2012 was for determined action and tangible progress. Real change. And at the moment, I think we, we want to see some more. Not because we're being difficult for the sake of being difficult, but the sorts of changes that I've been talking to you about, the positive benefits that I've been talking to you about, only will come into being, will only happen, if actually all of the changes that are required are genuine changes. So, uh, Ambassador Tominsky, Victoria's boss, when I hear him speak in public, he often talks about the importance not only of the number of new laws that your parliament passes, but the quality of those laws. Quantity and quality. Kalichistva and Kachistva. It sounds better in Russian. <coughs> it's both. Not just so that you can sign this agreement, but because it's about bringing the sorts of changes that will really help Ukraine to transform the country and to modernize the country. That's what it's about. Of course, the association agreements and so on is, is a way to help you do that. Learning from the experience of other countries, learning from the know-how of the EU. And that's just almost the final point that I would like to make, is look at countries like Poland, Slovakia, and see how the whole process of European integration has really helped to transform those economies. Take Poland. Its GDP per capita in 1991 was $2,406. In 2011, that had grown to 13,463. In Ukraine, it's about 7,000. It's about half. That process uh, of European integration, adapting legislation, norms, practices, can be incredibly positive. And in the EU, I think you will have a willing partner. Since 1991, the EU has invested 3.1 billion euros in Ukraine in terms of assistance. But it's not just about money, it's also about the the people-to-people -people support. And we've just had uh, a British expert, a, a, a remarkable man called Hugh Berridge, who's in his 80s, uh, but he's still working. And he's just gone to Egypt to start working there. But he has been working here with your standards agency, which sounds very boring and very dull. But the sort of work Hugh has been working on with, with German experts as well, it's a twinning project, we call it, is to ensure that your standards agency, which gives cert certificates to Ukrainian companies to say, you know, you've met the right standard, the whole purpose of that project is to ensure that once that your Ukrainian standards agency gives a big tick to say, yes, this particular product meets the standards, it can be exported to, a Europe, to Europe without going through 28 further checks. So very tangible, very practical support. And there are a whole host of twinners from different countries working in a whole host of different areas. Member states have their own programs as well. So there's all of that help waiting to, uh, to come to your, you know, to work in partnership with you to move forward. 
I was asked, finally, bear with me, um, I was asked, finally, just to say a few words about uh, this. Has anyone, I might get a bit depressed, but let's see. Has anyone seen this or heard this? Yes. Yes? Who said yes? Yes, you're top of my class. Thank you. Okay, Silnisi Razum, of Mestia, Stronger Together. What a, a large group of stakeholders, uh, various embassies, including my own, the delegation, uh, the Ukrainian government, your Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Presidential Administration, business associations, civil society, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have been doing is trying to work together more closely to talk about some of the things I've been talking about today. Because as I said at the beginning of my talk, um, if you look at the, the opinion polls that say that I was reading one in, in Viesti today that says that 40% of Ukrainians are in favor of close European integration and 35% in favor of the customs union. Uh, at the end of the day, that is your choice, not my choice. But Britain believes that close European integration would be good for Ukraine, good for the EU, and therefore good for Britain. So we and various other stakeholders uh, decided that we needed to do a little bit better uh, at explaining that. So I'm very grateful to the EU that they've invited me along today. Um, I've been in Chernigiv, in Nizhin, in Rivne, Chernobyl, um, myself in the last few weeks. We've been running workshops on the deep and comprehensive free trade area with your Ministry of Economy in Venezia and Chernigiv this week. We're going to Simferopol next week. Uh, we're doing further workshops, working with um, Taras Kachka, who you are going to be hearing from on Monday, and the Ukrainian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and Gennady Chizhikov. All about trying to explain, sit down, talk to people, listen, and have that debate, so that Ukrainians have a much better understanding than perhaps you've had thus far. Uh, that's not a criticism, that's perhaps more that we should have done better uh, at, at explaining what the benefits are collectively. Uh, but we hope that process uh, will be useful. Um, I've spoken for about double the length of time that I thought I was, um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm delighted to take any questions that you have either on what I've said or if I haven't said something that you wanted to ask about, please ask me those questions. But thank you very much for your attention. One request, one request. I'm deaf in this ear, okay? So shout at me, yeah? Then I'll hear you. Sorry, there's a question at the back, I think. Uh, you know, uh, in a few days, uh, in London, uh, Ukrainian ex uh, ex uh, uh, exhibition of Ukrainian products and cultural stuff. And um, how do you think, um, uh, can uh, such exhibitions and actions really help to, uh, strength, uh, to strengthen and to improve uh, trade between uh, the European Union members and Ukraine? And uh, one more addition. Uh, how do you think, in uh, which products um, Europe, European countries uh, interested much, uh, except uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural products? Good. Two really good questions, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ukrainian days in London, yes. Um, we're very heavily involved in, in sort of, well, not, we're not organizing it, it's, it's a Ukrainian initiative, it's a good initiative. I think the more countries and people know about each other, the better. The more understanding there is, the more awareness there is, the better. Um, so I'm sure that it will contribute to you know, closer relations. A single event, I mean, what I must say is a single event doesn't, you know, won't change everything. So um, I think it will be important to keep people, you know, people to people contacts going. We as a British embassy are doing something fairly similar in March next year. Uh, we're calling it British Days in Ukraine. There are business events fashion shows, culture, etc., uh, etc. Et so, yeah, it's a good thing to do, and it, it must help to tell people about things that they didn't know about before, and maybe that, that triggers something. In terms of products, apart from agricultural, um, I mentioned shale gas. 
you know, that is, an, I believe, an enormous opportunity for Ukraine. Let's hope the, the gas is there. I mean, until, until it's found, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a nice idea. But energy independence and energy security and taking your energy from different sources is, has to be a good thing. That, you know, certainly my country does that. We ship uh, liquid natrified liquid LNG, liquefied natural gas, from Qatar in, in the Gulf uh, all the way to the UK and then uh, liquefy it again. We have our own gas from the North Sea. So diversifying your, your, source, uh, your sources of energy is really important. Um, another area that I would mention um, is um, your sort of IT sector. Um, and... I was very privileged to host a lunch uh, at home a month or so ago with representatives of four or five Ukrainian startup organizations that, that help and work with bright, intelligent, young Ukraine, generally young Ukrainians who have clever ideas how to make Facebook better or Twitter better or I didn't understand most of the conversation, I have to, have to admit. Um, but, you know, these are young people who are you know, going to Silicon Valley to get investment from the US. We're trying to see what, how we can link them up with the UK. And there's a new British program called Sirius to, to help uh, uh, IT experts from any part of the world to, to go and, and work in the UK. Uh, you have a lot of uh, bright young IT technologists and engineers. So that's another area. But I know you didn't want me to talk about agriculture, but your agricultural potential is enormous, absolutely enormous. So let's, I have to say that, I have to say that. Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So it was really nice to hear that the government is really keen on getting Ukraine in the EU. And I'm uh, really interested in that uh, and the following question, does the whole union uh, perceive Ukraine as a real potential member state or let's say just as a full uh, reach in uh, natural resources area? Um, do all the member states see yeah. Ukraine as a potential member of the EU? As I said at the beginning, no. Is the straight okay. answer. Is, is, is yeah. the straight answer. Yeah. But, you know, um, the association agreement and DCFTA are in terms of their scale, the breadth, what is on offer, they are unprecedented. No other agreement of this scale has been offered to any other country. So I've heard that it, it, it's sort of, it's about 60% of what's, what's there, you know, membership sort of thing. So I think the whole membership perspective is not there. It is not going to happen in the next year or two years, but the association agreement and DCFTA really are a very powerful roadmap for transforming, modernizing uh, Ukraine, working in partnership, um, and learning from what has worked in other countries, but also as what hasn't worked. And you know, Ukraine and, and its people will have their own ideas about perhaps how to do some things better. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So, no, there is not a membership perspective at the moment, is the, is the straight answer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Day, thank you very much for telling us the positive uh, um, benefits uh, for Ukraine on mm. the signing of the association agreement. Uh, and uh, could you please uh, tell what are the benefits uh, for the European Union uh, of the signing? Uh, this agreement uh, besides uh, better investment climate, people to people contacts, and uh, reducing barriers you have already mentioned. Yeah, um, I'm not sure there is any. I, I hope I've covered most of the areas, but as I said, for, for Britain at least, and you know, I'm, I'm here as a British diplomat, um, we look at enlargement in the broadest sense. Now, we've just answered the question that you know, membership is not on the agenda now, but. The benefits of Ukraine, you know, a country, a large country of 45 million people learning to do business and work according to European rules for your benefit, 
Yes, of course, is for our benefit as well, in terms of 45 more million consumers, uh, more business opportunities, but also spreading the benefits of a better business climate, um, you know, the foreign policy cooperation that comes with this as well in a whole series of areas um, will make, will spread the benefits of enlargement of prosperity and security to Ukraine. Um, and, you know, the European Union, as I said right at the beginning, for, for Britain, the, the two real success stories have been the single market and enlargement. So I hope you can see how Ukraine sort of fits into, into both of those. Yeah, I think, you know, if, as I've, I hope I've explained, um, there is an enorm these agreements are an enormous opportunity to make uh, Ukraine wealthier, to make it a, an easier place to live, uh, a healthier place to live, and all of the good things I've tried to describe. That, therefore, I hope, will mean that young Ukrainians, when they get their really good degree and they have a really good idea, they want to stay in Ukraine to develop that idea. Maybe they will go to Britain, Germany, or, or the US to, to, to get some more education, to, to do a work placement or whatever. But then they come back. Um, and therefore, the, the Chevening Scholarship Program that I mentioned, the British government, um, whoops, sorry, hit my microphone. The British government scholarship that, that I mentioned, um, one of the key things that we're looking for is not young Ukrainians who are going to go and study at Oxford, Cambridge, London, Bristol, and then stay, because we want them to come back and use those skills here in Ukraine. So I'm delighted that you've got uh, Gennady Druzenko coming along later in the day, because he did just that. He got a gov British government scholarship, went to study in the UK, and is now back here. One of my colleagues in the embassy has done just the same. Uh, Sergei from the Institute of World um, policy that we work with um, on these things called street universities that you, you may have heard about where they do these, put these caricatures of what the EU looks like and what Ukraine looks like and it, it's you know, quite fun because they're caricatures. Yeah, Sergei is, a, is a, a, a graduate from one of the universities in London. So we want people to go uh, and come back and I hope through Ukraine becoming, having more and more opportunities here in Ukraine that yes, of course, young Ukrainians will largely want to stay, and those who go to live and work overseas will want to come back. Mr. Day, uh, what do you think? Um, uh, do Ukraine need to take some measures to uh, save our national currency and our route to EU, uh, as your country did? Um, to what such situation has now occurred in Greece, for example? Gosh. Um, <laughs> as I said, I am not an economist, so uh, I'm not going to try and um, answer that too directly, because um, if I'm honest, the answer would not be worth the paper it is written on. Um, but clearly, what Ukraine needs is you know, a well-functioning economy, where people pay taxes, those taxes get used to pay for high quality services, um, where you have a legal climate, uh, an environment that brings in foreign investors and allows, uh, allows companies to compete. Yes, you know, I read the same stories that you do in, in either the Ukrainian media or, or, the, or the foreign media that, that says there are some challenges. 
Um, but you know, we've seen in Europe that, that there are challenges too. You know, you mentioned Greece. You know, in my own country, you know, the British government is taking some very severe measures in terms of reducing government debt. Um, and one of the, but one of the reasons why you haven't seen uh, sort of a run on the British pound, why you haven't seen uh, Treasury, British Treasury bonds having very high interest rates is that there, generally speaking, is a lot of confidence in what the British government is trying to do. So even though, for me as a, as a British diplomat, I'm seeing our costs, you know, the amount of money being squeezed, it is a good thing. So you need, uh, you know, every country needs, you know, good fiscal management. Um, and I think some of the things that, uh, again, the association agreement and DCFTA will encourage you, uh, Ukrainian governments to do, to follow the, the key, the practices that we have in Europe, all of those things will help.